Here are some quick notes on the liquid drop model to accompany chapter 5 of To Build a Star. So the liquid drop model, when we say that, we're typically referring to the so-called semi-empirical mass formula. And it's named that because it is, it is empirical, it's ultimately fit to data, but semi-empirical because there is a decent physical justification behind the terms of the, the, the formula. So the formula gives you the binding energy of a nucleus given the number of protons that it has and the number of nucleons. So this is the sum of protons and neutrons. And conceptually, it's shown in this, uh, this picture, this nice picture in the upper right, Basically, you have a contribution to the binding energy from the volume of the nucleus. You have a penalty from the surface area of the nucleus, a penalty from the Coulomb repulsion of the protons within the nucleus, a penalty for any asymmetry, so not having the same number of protons and neutrons, and there can be a, a bonus, uh, a penalty, or nothing at all, depending on your pairing. And this basically depends on whether or not you have odd numbers of protons, odd numbers of neutrons, or odd numbers of nucleons give you the, the plus or the minus or nothing. Okay, so there are lots of forms of the semi-empirical mass formula, so be careful if you're just taking a set of parameters that somebody says, hey, these are the, these are the volume surface Coulomb asymmetry pairing, whatever, in terms of the semi-empirical mass formula, because there's lots of different ways to parameterize it. So this one is one that I tend to use in codes where I'm using it. Um, because it's the first formula that I came across when I was learning about it. So again, this is just slightly more mathematical. We have our volume surface Coulomb asymmetry and uh, pairing. And now we're gonna try to understand what the functional forms are for these different um, components of the semi-empirical mass formula. So the first part is the volume and the, we're gonna lay out the logic behind why you'd have this, these certain functional forms. So each nucleon has some self-binding, right? E is equal to mc squared. And so we're just gonna give um, some amount of binding to the nucleus just for each nucleon. So that's gonna go as A. Now there's gonna be a penalty for having increased surface area. It's because you, you basically don't have any neighbors nearby to be bound to. And in the analogy to a liquid drop, there's a penalty for the, the surface tension. So our radius, right, goes as the a to the one-third. This is an empirical thing. You can measure the radii of nuclei, for instance, with electron scattering, and find the radius goes as the mass number to the one-third. We know the surface area of a sphere goes as the radius squared, and so then the functional form for the surface penalty should go as a to the two-thirds. There's a penalty for Coulomb repulsion, so if you get too many protons, then the nucleus wants to push apart, right? The energy for a charged sphere, right, it's k, uh, kq squared over r, so it goes as the charge squared over the radius. As we discussed, the radius goes as the mass number to the one-third, and your charge is just the number of protons, right? So you'd expect sort of z squared over a to the one-third. Of course, a single proton doesn't repel itself, and so typically the functional form will have a z times z minus one in the numerator, and then divided by your proxy for the radius. For the asymmetry, uh, z equals to n is favorite, so the same number of protons and neutrons. This is because in the strong force, the proton-neutron attraction is slightly stronger than the proton-proton or the neutron-neutron. So this is slightly favored. So you tend to favor uh, proton number is equal to the mass number divided by 2. Um, it's less of a problem for large masses, um, just because, you know, you're you're basically worrying about not being equal, but there's there's more nucleons doing some binding, so it's, you know, this is empirical anyways, uh, winds up being kind of weighted by the uh, number of nucleons you have. And so one parameterization of this so-called asymmetry term is your proton number minus the mass number divided by two squared divided by the mass number. This is one that is often listed differently, and it is also different in the, in the book. So be careful about the functional form here. Uh, the Coulomb form is also often different. Sometimes people don't have the z minus 1. And then one that is not treated in the book, it's just briefly mentioned, is the pairing term. And here, um, you basically favor 
spin zero nucleon pairs. So you basically nucleons want a dance partner. You want to you want to have a, a proton to pair with every other proton, uh, or a neutron to pair with every other neutron, or in the worst case, at least a proton and neutron to pair together. So you basically favor these nucleon pairs. You disfavor unpaired nucleons. And so empirically, this winds up going as 1 over the square root of the mass number. I've never seen a good physical justification for this functional form. It just kind of is. So if we have an even number of protons and an even number of neutr neutrons, we get a little benefit to our binding. If we have an odd number of protons and an odd number of neutrons, we get a, a penalty to the binding. If we have an even number of protons or neutrons, and then an odd number of the other type of nucleon, then, then nothing happens. And then what you have is these fit parameters here, these little a sub whatevers, are fit to your data. Um, so you see it's, it's uh, that's what makes it semi-empirical, right? Is there's at least a hand wavy theory to go along with this, but then you fit it to data in the end. And the contributions look something like this. So this is a really nice plot uh, from Robley Evans from a long time ago. So you have the average binding energy per nucleon uh, versus mass number. And you can see basically the consequences of this semi-empirical mass formula. So you start out with some bulk binding from the volume. You get a penalty from the surface. That brings you down to this level. You then get a penalty again from the Coulomb energy. And then finally you get a penalty from the asymmetry and, and pairing is not treated here, but you basically see um, how you go from just the bulk binding to something that actually looks like our binding energy um, per nucleon uh, as a function of mass number. And you'll uh, basically determine this curve in the homework. So this semi-empirical mass formula, it might sound quite hand wavy, but I just want to stress that it is it's often close enough. So for instance, if we take the uh, convert binding energy to atomic mass excess, which is mentioned in the book, if we take the difference between that and the empirical, uh, the actual measured data, so this is from the 2012 atomic mass evaluation, you see the deviations are often on the order of, let's say, 5 to maybe 15 MeV for most uh, nuclei. And that might sound kind of big, but keep in mind that the binding energies, right, are roughly the mass number times 8 MeV. And so you're talking about, you know, several hundred MeV or even up to a GeV of binding. And so this deviation is often on the order of a percent. So with this just hand wavy model, you get within a percent of the correct binding energy. And that's close enough that you can often just use this liquid drop model um, in in model calculations um, if you need something that's simple and analytic. So sometimes it's used for the structure of a neutron star crust, for instance. Oftentimes people will cook in a um, so-called shell correction by hand, um, and I'll kind of show what that is below. And so, uh, for instance, what we can do is with our uh, non-accreted neutron star crust, we can plot the proton or neutron number for the equilibrium nucleus as a function of the depth into the outer crust of the neutron star. And just the liquid drop model are these smooth curves. So the uh, proton number for the equilibrium nucleus is that red band. The neutron number is the black band. And then if you use proper state-of-the-art nuclear mass models, you instead get these uh, rectangular looking things. So you see that if you just need the general trend, liquid drop model totally good enough. And then what you can cook in by hand if you want is so-called shell corrections, and that is what will make you jump at a given um, depth from one proton and neutron number to, to another. But in general, the liquid drop model does pretty amazing, and if you want the fit parameters uh, for the functional form on the previous slide, these are the ones that I fit to the 2012 atomic mass evaluation data. Okay. Um, one neat example of what else you can get from the liquid drop model is uh, fission. So the liquid drop model pretty, you know, gives you a pretty good semi-quantitative picture of how fission works. So what we're going to do is we're going to treat our nucleus as a liquid drop, and we're going to consider what happens when you deform it. So when you deform it, your volume doesn't change, your number of nucleon pairs doesn't change, but your surface is going to get larger, so there's going to be a larger surface penalty, 
and your charges are going to be spaced further apart. So there's going to be less Coulomb repulsion, right? Because it, it goes as one over the distance between the charges and you're spacing them further apart. So basically your Coulomb penalty is going to decrease, but the surface penalty is going to increase. And if we want to figure out, okay, what is the change in binding energy of a nucleus from deformation, then the final binding energy minus the initial, you're going to have the perturbed Coulomb energy so the Coulomb energy for your deformed nucleus plus the perturbed surface energy for your deformed nucleus minus your original Coulomb and surface terms that we saw two slides ago. So what we can do is we can parameterize the shape of the nucleus as an ellipsoid. So we'll just go for a very simple deformation going from this sphere to this ellipsoid here where we have a semi-major uh, semi -major and semi-minor axes. Um, if you do it as an ellipsoid, you can just go to your... Uh, the Legendre polynomial, you just have the, the piece of two component here um, is your deviation from uh, sphericity. And you can relate this deformation parameter here to the semi-major and semi-major, semi-minor axes in this way if you use some uh, geometry gymnastics. So what we can do is we can expand the Coulomb term um, from two slides ago and the surface term and if you're very careful, you find something like this. You have your regular Coulomb term is then perturbed. Um, it's decreased a little bit by this amount given by the deformation. Your surface penalty is increased as promised by this amount given by the deformation. And so then the change in energy that you have depends on, there's a factor out front for the deformation. So it scales with the deformation. And you're basically looking at the difference between two times the surface penalty and the Coulomb energy. So then in this picture, our liquid drop is going to split once the uh, Coulomb energy is equal to two times the surface energy. At that point, um, probably should just have an equality here, whatever. At that point, when these two are equal, the thing is going to split apart. So then in our naive picture of a nucleus, the fissionability um, the degree to which it's going to fission is just the ratio between the Coulomb energy and two times the surface energy of our nucleus. And so if X is equal to one, then this thing will definitely split immediately. If X approaches one, that means you're prone to fissioning. Um, what we tend to do is um, people tend to instead calculate the ratio between the charge squared divided by the mass number uh, for your nucleus and some critical uh, value. And these z squared over a, right, this just pops out of considering right, your Coulomb and your surface term. So you can take the functional form for these and you'll see why then you get the z squared over a ratio. Um, so we could use our uh, semi-empirical mass formula to get these, uh, to get these values. In practice, uh, people wind up fitting this to some kind of data, doing a slightly more sophisticated calculation based on um, how the nucleus deforms, not just that simple ellipsoid model. And you can get something like this functional form here, according to this textbook. And again, keep in mind that a larger fissionability means you're more prone to fission. So you don't need to be exactly equal to one to fission. You just, as you approach it, you're going to be more prone to fission. Um, so let's see how that uh, compares to reality here. So we have the nuclear chart in the uh, both bottom parts of the uh, slide here. So proton number increases in the vertical direction, neutron number in the horizontal. The purple uh, shapes on the left-hand side, these are just all the nuclei with known mass as of 2012. On the right-hand side, you have um, all known nuclei or different squares, and the black boxes, these are the stable nuclei, the ones that do not undergo radioactive decay. Um, so then again, back on the left, the, um, what's shown in the orange here, this boundary, this is basically the fissionability um, from this equation right here. That's our boundary. If we instead use our simple liquid drop model picture, so we use the liquid drop model, uh, the semi-empirical mass formula for the Coulomb and the surface energy, we get this green dashed line here. If I then decrease fissionability to 0.8, so say we're approaching it, we're not exactly at it, but we're prone to fissioning. We get that slice through the nuclear chart. 
Now let's go look over at reality. The colors of the boxes indicate the decay mode. Spontaneous fission are the green ones up here. And you often have induced fission for these heavier nuclei. And you see that you can uh, basically spontaneous fission happens above this boundary. And roughly speaking, that is what is cut through by this formula. So the liquid drop model actually gives you a pretty interesting insight into the nucleus. Besides just the nuclear mass, you can also learn about deformation and how that leads to fission. So it's kind of cool. And that is it for these quick notes on the liquid drop model.